They say there's no such thing as writer's block. If you're a writer and you can't think of anything to write about, it's because you just want to write about something good. You want to, you want to do good writing, but if you can't think of anything good, you just stare at the blank page. But you can always write. You can write about what you did this morning when you got out of bed, what you had for dinner last night, the last phone call you had, the friends that are no longer with you. You can write about anything. So there's really no such thing as a writer's block. It's just a trick you play on yourself because once you start writing, as I have found over the years, even if you have nothing worthwhile to write about at the moment, if you write something that's not good, it's maybe even bad, you're getting something out of your system, but you're going through the motions, the process of writing. You're putting words on the screen, on the page. They may not be the best you've ever done, but don't worry about it. Hey, Hemingway and Asimov and Steinbeck, they all felt the writing often came up short. They were criticized not only by themselves, but by people their entire career, but they didn't let it stop them. They just kept showing up. And I think that's the real thing. Just keep showing up. Uh, this video blog slash podcast doesn't have a ton of viewers or listeners, but, you know, they do add up over time. The views are quite a bit. The, uh, the listens are quite a bit. And I keep showing up just because I made a commitment to do that. So keep showing up. It's worth something. Uh, maybe it's worth only what you get out of doing it, whatever it is, doing it consistently. But that is something. And people do eventually notice. And no one expects you to get a huge audience right away or ever, maybe. And frankly, you probably don't really need one. When people who like what you do discover what you do, just think of all the material that you'll have for them to go through. Hey, it's Tim Patterson. This is Trade Show Guy. And this is Trade Show Guy Monday Morning Coffee. Want to Thank uh, Hydro Flask for the new coffee mug they gave me when I when I saw them down in Expo West <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. Uh, yeah, I've been doing this program for over two years. I've been blogging for over 10 years. I've owned this company, Trade Show Guy Exhibits, for almost eight years in July. I just keep showing up. Uh, and partly because I made the commitment to myself that I would do it. And partly because... At this point, it would feel weird if I stopped doing the show weekly. It would feel weird if I missed a week. I did miss a week earlier this month because of my travel schedule to Expo West. I looked at it and said, you know, I'm just not going to be able to get that done. Uh, it's like the daily yoga I do or the walk I do with the dog each morning. If I were to miss it, it wouldn't feel right. It'd feel wrong. So, yeah, I keep showing up. Uh, my business is coming off one of the best quarters it's ever had, and things look good for Q2 of 2019. So, you know, maybe there is something to showing up huh so thanks for watching thanks for listening i really appreciate it tell a friend tell a colleague and what the heck uh, write a review on apple podcasts uh, i frequently have guests on this program and today i've got a guest i often have guests that have experience in the event or conference or trade show world but not always uh, sometimes i just have a guest that i think would be a fun interview and someone i think would make a good addition to the program and somebody I just want to talk to which is why today I'm sharing an interview I did with Dave Scott, a longtime radio professional. Uh, we'll hear a little about a bit about his radio career and the path he's been on. Our paths crossed in Portland in radio in the mid-90s, and although we've actually never worked together at the same station at the same time, we did work at the same call letters at different times. And as we talked, uh, we don't even know each other really well, but we've met each other a few times. And as we talked, we ended up discovering we have... Uh, more in common th than we originally thought. So uh, here's how that chat went with Dave Scott. I want to welcome to uh, Trade Show Guy Monday Morning Coffee, Dave Scott, longtime radio guy, also a, a drummer like me, uh, a, a podcaster. And uh, welcome to the show, Dave. It's, it's a pleasure to have you. Your, your, your paths and I have crossed uh, with mine many times over the years, but we've never really gotten to know each other very well. No, we haven't. And it is funny, the, the parallels with our journey. Uh, both played the drums. We uh, we've been longtime radio rats, and I just discovered that as a Plan B, you worked at Hollywood Video as well for a short time, and as you did too, which we were both laughing at in the green room. That was pretty funny. So is, is, I'm curious. Isn't that, isn't, that, isn't that funny that our Plan B didn't last as long as no. our, our original <laughs> career? <laughs> yeah. Well, we can talk about that, but I'm curious. Uh, when was your first day on the radio? Do you remember the first day, the data of that, by any, by any chance? Oh, my goodness. What a fun question. Um, I got into radio in 19... Okay, it was 1976, so it was the bicentennial year. Oh, okay. I went, I went to a broadcasting school. I lived in Minneapolis. I'm from the Midwest, and I grew up in Minneapolis. And it was, uh, I went to Brown Institute. It was a nine-month course, and, and part, of the, uh, 
part of the appeal of the course was that you got a first class license because this is oh, back yeah. when you had to have a license. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't one of those guys that, that grew up always wanting to be on the, uh, on the air. It hadn't even occurred to me until I was about 20, 19 or 20. Um, I'd been a musician and thought that, that was kind of what I was going to do. And then got a real good feel for what that life was like. And it took about a year, <laughs> took about a year of solid being on the road and living with guys in a band to determine, no, this was not going to be my path. And it, it all began with a, um, a stop in Rapid City, South Dakota. Uh-huh. Our, band, our band was playing at a bar called The Mining Camp. And, uh, you know, after, after having been in radio now, I understand what the deal was. Part of the deal was the band that played at The Mining Camp uh, was interviewed by the Saturday DJ. So we got invited to the radio station, and I will never forget that first time I walked into the radio station and, and smelled the smells, yeah. and saw the records, and saw the microphones, and I was... I was struck by how much I love this. And immediately after that gig, we got back to Minneapolis. I quit the band. <laughs> I went to Brown Institute. Uh, nine months later, they placed me in Great Falls, Montana. And so that would have been June of 1976, my very first job. Interesting. I actually beat you by a year. I'm, I'm surprised. I thought you had made it before me. But I, I had a friend in high school in Bend that worked at the local radio station. And, and when I was a junior and senior, I'd go hang out at the station. And it was a daytime station. So they'd sign off in the winter at 4.30, 4.45. And I'd go in and play in the studio. I thought, this is something I got to do, you know. Ended up going to a couple years of uh, community college and then got hired. My first day in there was April Fool's Day, 1975. <laughs> that should have told you something right it there. It told me something right there. So I've always remembered that, April Fool's Day. And it was in the Dalles, yeah. up, the, up, the, uh, up the Columbia Gorge, and stayed there a year and a half and then ended up in Salem and then up to Portland. And that's where our paths crossed. But, uh, so we're, we're some of the call letters you've been at over the years, you've been in some pretty good places. Yeah, let's see. Well, my, my path was uh, Great Falls, Montana, and then that was sold, and I went to uh, a little town in Iowa, which was just outside of Waterloo, Iowa, Independence, Iowa. That's where I got my first crack at uh, programming, and I was there for about a year and a half, and then went to the uh, station down in southeast Texas that that company owned, uh, and it was a rock station, and got to program down there in southeast Texas, and I was there for about three years, and while I was down there, I entered uh, the... Uh, you do, do you remember Drake Chenault? Oh, yeah. yeah. Jingle Company. Yes. Well, they, had a, they had a thing called the, uh, the Drake Chenault Talent Search. And I, I threw my hat in the ring there and actually won that. Wow. Uh, that year, part of, the, part, of the, uh, part of the prize was they pressed a record. This was how far back it goes, yeah. 1978. So they set a record around the, uh, around the world with uh, your air check on it. I was on with uh, Greaseman, Howard Stern. <laughs> Uh, me and uh, one guy from KMET. I don't remember his name, but uh, that's what got my job in Seattle. So I, I had the before I knew there was a leap of the week. I had the leap of the week. I went from Beaumont, Texas, to Seattle. Wow! And, and I was there from '81 to '87, and then started jonesing to do some morning radio. So I went from Seattle to Spokane, and that's where I met a guy that I worked with for 11 years, Tom Turner. You know right. Tom. Oh, I, yeah, well, I've met Tom. Sure, you guys did the Dave and Tom show in uh, Portland for a while. That's absolutely right. We we met in Spokane, and then we got hired uh, at KGON from there. And we were in K, we were at KGON from uh, 90 to 94. Uh, that's when Mark and Brian started syndicating, and we lost our job and went to Yakima for a couple of years. And then came back and uh, went to Portland uh, for Earth 105, and I've been in Portland ever since. So I was at Earth 105, The Beat, um, and then a nice long stretch at Kink, which was a wonderful time. Love that radio station. I was there from yeah. 2014. And then uh, back to KGON for about a year and a half. And, and as I recall, when you were at Kink, you, the, the radio station won the Marconi Award. Is that when you were there? It was. That was the year. That, that was, which was the radio station of the year, for people who aren't yes. familiar with that, in the country. Uh, yeah. and, and kudos to everybody there. I don't know what happened to the station after you left. So, you know, <laughs> well, you know, as, as radio does, radio changes. And, and uh, <laughs> You're familiar with the PPM. It's a new methodology for taking ratings. And it really did not uh, do kind things to kink. Kink was uh, perennially number one or number two. Yeah. And yeah. Sheila Hamilton and I in the morning were uh, top five for like six, seven years. And then they went to this PPM, which essentially, if you don't understand it, it's kind of like you wear a beeper on your belt. 
Right. And the, the beeper will emit a signal and all the radio stations have their own unique identifying signal. And the PPM, well, I'm sorry, the PPM doesn't emit it. It picks up the signal. It picks so up the signal, right, right. I had that backwards. And uh, there's just something about the way the, uh, the, the little uh, PPM meters were located around the market. Uh, there weren't enough in the, the Multnomah County metro area, which is where kink was really strong. It was just really tragic. You know, kink went from number one, number two, to down to about 11 or 12. <laughs> and that's where it stayed ever since. Uh, yeah, yeah. Really it's, it's, it, it, you live and die with uh, on TV and, and radio by the ratings. And uh, it used to be that you'd fill out a diary, you'd hand fill it out and mail it in. And, and you could kind of cheat a little if you had one of those, uh, but you can't cheat with what the stations are actually on, you know? So uh, nope. most people actually listen to it. Different stories. It, it's just kind of like the way the billboard charts are different than they used to be. Uh, fascinating industry, though, and I, I spent uh, 25, 26 years full-time in it, and you've spent uh, more than that, but uh, it's it's interesting industry. Never made a, lot, a ton of money, but I sure had a ton of fun. <laughs> well, and that's that's the addictive thing about this. Yeah. You go through a lot of grief, but it's because it's so fun, and it's such a lifestyle. You know, it just gets in your blood. It, it's yeah. show business, you know, pure and it, simple. It's show business. It really is. It is no more secure than being in Hollywood and being an actor. Sometimes it's great and you get work and other times you're, uh, as they say, in between projects. Exactly. In between projects. It reminds me of the time when I was at, uh, I think it was Kissing when we were up on the hill up in Portland and it was during a campaign and Rob Lowe came through to campaign for one of the candidates and he sat in with a friend of mine uh, and he, for an hour he says, man, if I couldn't be doing movies, I'd be doing this. This is fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was it was a great 40, 45 year career, and I'm still in the business more yeah. or less. I'm just not live. Uh, I'm voice tracking now for stations down in Southern Oregon, uh, so I'm still on the air down there. And then I'm working for a great company called Internet Jock, which does voiceover work uh, all over the world. So you know, I still have my my fingers in the pond. Yeah. It's just that I get to work from home now, which is a blessing and a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to do. Well, that that brings us to the uh, question I'm, uh, I want to explore. Um, my dog's barking because I think uh, my stepson's home, so he'll be in the distance. <laughs> uh, you have a podcast uh, called Embrace the Change. Tell me about that because you've gone through a lot of changes and you decided to start podcasting about this. Tell, tell me how that came about. Oh, sure. I, um, I did uh, start this up about a year ago, and it was born of all the changes that I've gone through in my career and the ability to be the Friday morning quarterback afterwards and look back and think, as dire as the situation may have seemed, and I always seem to come back to the period at KGON after we lost our job when Mark and Brian syndicated, that would I, I would say was the low point of my career because we loved Portland and we uh, weren't thrilled about having to go to Yakima, but we did it as a career move. Um, and... You know, there were nights at 3 a.m. where I was just thinking to myself, my career is over. There's just no getting out of this hole. Right. But one thing led to another. And, and in being part of the radio scene in Yakima, I met people that actually were integral in getting me my job at Kink. The program director down there in Yakima was the guy that was my in at Kink to talk to Dennis Constantine because – was not a very you had to have kind of an end to even get in to talk. oh yeah to even get a to to, to get a, to get an interview to get a to, a, a chat yeah exactly a absolutely I, you have to know somebody who knows somebody and that worked out because i had gone to yakima and so i started thinking wow all the things in my life that never would have happened had i not gone to yakima as much as i was <laughs> upset about it at the time so maybe to learn to embrace the change to assume that the the change is leading you somewhere it's obviously happening it's what is going on right now in your life. So really, what is the point of fighting? it? What is the point of fighting what is actually happening in your life? And then in, in doing that, I thought that if I opened it up to you know, people in general, uh, maybe you know, start a website and invite people to come in and, and tell me their stories and then share them, uh, you can put them out into the great Ethernet. And um, maybe someone listening at 3 a.m. in their darkest <laughs> night of the soul would hear it and go, oh. Well, okay. I think uh, I see a little glimmer of hope, and that was kind of my that was kind of the genesis of the idea. And then in doing that, I've just I've I've talked to to so many interesting people, musicians, and I'm beginning to see a commonality in all these stories. In that, uh, um, they're always happy afterwards. I mean, the the change, although it wasn't great at the time, has led them to a further understanding about what they really are. 
at their core. They've, it's, taught them, it's taught them about themselves so that as they look back in hindsight, they're much more educated about uh, how to live a happier life, how to live their life so that they're, they're more in tune to uh, being true to themselves. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think part of it, it has to be that uh, a lot of times we hit what we think is bottom, and it may be bottom, but that is, uh, it's kind of trite, but it's true. I think it's a character builder that you kind of, if you come through that or as you come through it, because we, we all do, because there's always things past that, uh, that you learn from that experience and uh, you use that, you know, character building that experience to face whatever may come next with a little, you know, you're a little more hardened to it and you're a little more a- a- adaptable and, and, and flexible to things that may come along that, you know, 10 years ago might have just really, really thrown you. I've certainly been through changes in my <laughs> life as well as we all, uh, all, all are. So, yeah. So, yeah. so tell me some of the, the people that you've talked to. I'm just curious to, you know, share maybe one or two of those uh, quick stories. Well, let's see. I talked to a musician that, uh, his name is Marty McRae, local musician, couple of local musicians, interesting stories. Marty um, was a part of the rock scene in the 90s when Mm -hmm. everybody was moving to Los Angeles. Right. And, And Marty actually did go to Los Angeles, did get invited to that meeting at the record company, was sitting at the table... Uh, with the deal ready to be signed, and he balked because <laughs> there was just something inside him. And this is where I really related because it was a lot of the reason I got out of the music industry. Uh, it just didn't feel like what was going to be able to allow him to live the life that he felt he wanted to live. He was kind of a family guy, just like me. He was kind of a home buddy. Uh, didn't really like the idea of uh, being on the road all the time. And, and uh, although it was enticing and it was exciting seeing his dream possibly coming true there was just something that wouldn't let him take that next step and so uh he didn't sign he came back to (laughs) portland and and we talked about his story and he's had a very happy successful career here still plays locally uh he's a weekend warrior with about two or three great local bands and is very happy although he just had a triple bypass surgery so he came through with he came through with flying colors there and is back on the uh the healing path and so uh, there was his story. Uh, I talked to another guy that is in the process of packing up and, and leaving Portland. Uh, he made the decision to leave Portland after 25 years, uh, sell everything, and move to uh, North Carolina, which was home growing up. And he did that uh, because he was a single guy, and he was in his 60s, and he thought to himself, well, I think what I want to do is position myself to be closer to friends and family. Uh, so that I can live out my my final years surrounded by the people I love, right. rather than being in Portland, which is a city I love, but I'm kind of out here on my own. Uh, a big decision because you know you and I both know how lovely Portland is. Oh yeah, yeah. Nice to even think about leaving, but he had made that decision. So we went through that, and then in the course of his story, he told this charming story of uh, a little girl that uh, he developed a crush on back in grade school. Uh, and how she ended up being the uh, impetus that led him into a musical life as well. So uh, (laughs) it was kind of an interesting little uh, six degrees of separation story for him. So those are the kind of stories that that I'm beginning to share. I'm thinking of going down to uh, Capitola, California here in a couple weeks if I can get it together. I want to interview a a, uh, Indian shaman. This is a guy that as a teenager uh, went into the desert and spent time with this tribe of, uh, 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 it was a Mexican tribe and the shaman had been there his entire life and decided that he really believed in the lifestyle and became this uh, shaman's apprentice, lived with him for years and years and finally took over after the shaman died. Um, I met him, I met him because last year I was having some really intense spinal issues that had begun to really spiral and it was beginning to, uh, was really beginning to take me down because I started to think, oh my God, this, this pain is going to be a part of my final years. Um, and there was nothing short of surgery that I could think of that would solve it. And you hear so much about spinal surgery and how you really need to take uh, careful steps when you make a decision like that. And then I had a friend who said, you need to go see this guy. His name's Brent Secunda. <laughs> he said that when he was in Seattle, my friend is a runner and he had uh, plantar fasciitis and nothing. He did solved it and then it was recommended he he visit this brent secunda guy which he did and he said you know he, he's kind of a skeptic and he said brent 
did what you would think a shaman would do. He, he danced, he chanted, he had eagle feathers, uh, he had all the rituals. And, you know, Kevin's a polite guy. He said, yeah, well, okay, that was interesting. <laughs> he said 30 days to the day that he had seen the shaman, he realized all of a sudden his foot quit hurting for the first time in like over two years. Wow. And so I went to see him, and I kid you not, uh, although it's not completely gone, it has become not even a factor in my life. It's, it's just become a little quirk in my life that is totally manageable. Wow. Uh, and it just leads me to really believe that the body can heal itself if given the opportunity, if you can step out of the way. So I hope to go down there and, and interview him and bring his story to the podcast as well. Because talk about a change, being no, a teenager no and, and deciding to live with, uh, with a tribe and, and, and be schooled by a, a Mexican Indian shaman, that's, that's a big change. That is a story. I'm looking forward to hearing that. And that's what's great about stories, and I'm glad you're sharing a lot of those, is that, that stories are the glue that holds the human existence together, I think. That's probably the most important thing. Stories have been passed down you know, since before we could write them down. So. David, it's about great to talk with you. Where's the best place to find your uh, podcast? Uh, you go to my website. It's well, actually, we've got them. I'm, we're up on iTunes. We're up on um, we're up on Spotify, Facebook, Twitter, and then if if all else fails, just go to davescottnow.com. Davescottnow.com, and they're all catalog there for you. Cool. It's uh, called Embrace the Change. Dave, uh, we could talk yes. forever. I do appreciate you spending some time with uh, me here on uh, Trade Show Guy Monday Morning Coffee. Let's do it again. It's been my pleasure. Great to see you again. Thanks, Dave. Hey, thanks again to Dave Scott for joining me today on Trade Show Guy Monday Morning Coffee. Time for this week's Trade Show Tip of the Week. And it comes from the experience that a number of our clients are having a post-show from that big show we did earlier this month, Natural Products Expo West. During setup and dismantle of the exhibits, a number of clients and our setup guys noticed that in some places their exhibit was showing signs of wear and tear, which is frankly the most you know common thing that seems to happen in the industry. Exhibits are made to be set up, dismantled, fitted into a crate for shipping halfway across the country and schlepped around by trucks and forklifts and lifted up and they get dropped and they get banged and they, they things happen. Repairs are very common. They need to be made. And these clients are doing the right thing. They're taking the time shortly after the show when there's no big rush to get the exhibit on the road for the next show to make sure that any needed repairs and refurbishments or upgrades are done. In one case, Got a client that's looking at having their crates remade or repaired completely because they're many, many years old. Uh, another is making sure they have spare parts. Another is uh, fixing faulty hinges and clasps and replacing missing pieces. You know, now is the time to do it and not wait until the next show and then, you know, kick yourself for not having done it or taken note of what needed to be done at the last show of the repairs that should be made. So post-show, make sure uh, you know what needs to be done during the show. Take a note, take pictures, so you know what uh, needs to be fixed. Uh, this week's one good thing before we wrap it up. Final tip of the hat to longtime Seattle Mariner Ichiro Suzuki, who is retiring after a, what, 27-year career as a professional baseball player. His stats are, you know, frankly, a bit crazy. Uh, rookie of the year, MVP in the same year when he hit the Mariners, I think in 2001. 10-time All-Star in the U.S., 10-time Golden Glove Award winner in the U.S., three-time Fielding Bible Award winner, three-time Silver Slugger Award winner, over 3,000 hits in total in the majors. And if you add all his nine years in Japanese professional baseball to what he did in the USA, he totaled 4,367 hits in his entire career. And that arm. I saw a clip uh, from just last week. He was playing... Uh, with the Mariners, and somebody nailed a, a, a line drive, and he caught it on the run from either center field or right field and threw it to third base a strike. The guy has an arm. He always has. It's just great fun watching him. I wish him well in retirement, but, uh, yeah, I have no doubt in five years he'll be welcome to the Baseball Hall of Fame, no doubt. So uh, Ichiro Suzuki, uh, the one good thing that I'm mentioning this week. Hey, it's Tim Patterson, trade show guy, Monday morning coffee. Have yourself a great week.